I can kind of multitask. We're back. back. We are back. <laughs> Week three. Week three. Welcome, everyone. You got Matt here, Brian, of course. Off screen is Luke, who's lending us his computer again. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> we Hopefully, we don't have any automatic updates. <laughs> We're looking at you, Casey. We still love you, but Man, get it together. Right. That's embarrassing. Come on. So, tonight. <laughs> If we're you haven't noticed, excited. we're really excited for that. <laughs> we have Alex, and it's Alex. Live. Local. Local. Alex Lapkus. That's okay. I'm not worried. Can everybody see him? I mean, yeah, it's all good. feel free to use the chat as we're going forward. We will respond as we can. We're going to take breaks, go to the chat window during different parts um, so that we can answer questions but we're not going to stop every time you ask a question just so you know check out the new logo hoodies we just got in does everybody hear us i know i just i think i had the uh i had one of the audios down unfortunately so welcome everyone it looks like we got 11 people so far which is mm -hmm. awesome uh i know people are gonna keep tuning in as we go um, do you have any, yeah. do you want, should we start time? Should we ask Alex about his guide service? Uh, how he came to be streamer yeah, extraordinaire? Come oh, on. God. Tell us about like your streamer journey. Oh boy. Oh man. It started, well, it started a long time ago and it started with Rusty teaching me sort of the ins and outs of some of the streamer stuff, but not really. He always hated it. And then it really blossomed when I started fishing with Russ. Oh, that's when I started really getting in a drift boat more, and that would have been early 2002. I don't know, 2001 maybe, 2000. Before that, it was kind of a lot of weed fishing, because that's what I did over on the Asabola Ton. And then I started fishing with Russ a bunch, started seeing some new ways to do it. Um, and then, as he, of course, was taught by Kelly, who's sort of, they refer to the godfather of streamer fishing. Um, and, yeah, it just kind of gone from there changed over the years it's changed a lot um you know you think you got something figured out and you keep mixing it up and all of a sudden you just keep learning um which has kind of been the nice thing and it's been really fun um i used to rely more on you know oh this cool pattern this cool pattern and now i find myself actually fishing less patterns that are less extravagant with better presentation and i think that that's been key um I don't know. It just kind of keeps going. The Arkansas thing really changed how I streamer fished. It went from, you know, uh, I've been guiding down there. I've been going down there. I think this will be the 13th year. And I've been guiding down there a good oh, 10 or so. 11? 11, I'd say. Um, and that really changes how you streamer fish. It's a much different river, much larger. It's There's a lot more to think about. Fish are highly pressured. There's 50 boats a day throwing at them. I mean, they get beat on. So you really have to fine-tune presentation and, you know, start figuring things out a little bit differently. The size of the river, the character of the river makes you learn, makes you have to learn, or you will not catch fish. Um, so that that's taken me a long, a long ways, and now you can also apply it here, and it shows me different stuff. I look at structure differently. I look at areas differently. I look at flies differently and presentations differently. Um, and it all helps and builds. When you're fishing over that many fish, it, it teaches you how to fine tune things. Um, one thing though that I will say is I've, well, I fish a handful of different flies. Um, and, and I've kind of gotten a little, I don't like using the word lazy, but I guess that's probably the right word. Um, I've kind of simplified some stuff. I think that, that you know, you, you don't need to be super creative as far as you don't need to spend an hour tying a fly to catch fish. You can tie a 15 minute fly that's gonna produce just as well as something that takes you an hour. Um, I've gone through using a lot of shanks. I've gone through using no shanks. Um, you know, they've got their advantages. I don't like using a lot of shanks, frankly, because I'm guiding a lot and they have a tendency to foul. When you joint those the shanks together, they have a tendency to twist, catch, and foul up a lot. When I'm dealing with clients and know the importance of every cast, and if somebody rushes their basket, back cast, it comes out in a ball. So I've kind of gone a little simpler where I'm just using usually one shank off the back of a two-hook platform. I feel like the two-hook platform still hooks fish very well, so I tend to stick with it. Um, I'm going to show you today a few, two different patterns based off the same platform. Um, I actually prepped one so I can just show you 
the front half of the second plyometi. Um, ones with a small to medium fish skull on the head, you can see how lazy I've gotten. I don't even glue eyes on them anymore because um, they'll just fall off in the first 15 casts and it doesn't matter. No, no, buy super <laughs> glue. Come on. Oh, yeah, right. Got to have, gotta have the eyes. Um, who knows? Whatever. I, I don't think it matters. Um, but basically, you can see it's a, it's a small shank off the back, a smaller hook, and then, of course, a bigger front hook with a small to medium fish skull head. I like the small mediums. I'll go up as far as the mediums on eight inch flies, but I only really like those in high water situations. I think you like you get too much fall to where you don't have an effective presentation. You can't slow it down where you want to slow it down if you have too much weight. It also doesn't get cast rougher. So if you're throwing big casts of 50, 60 feet, you have more issues. A short 30 foot cast, 25 foot cast, you can smack it and push it forward and really cover and do it fine, but the second you start throwing 50, 60 foot a line, you really want something that balances better with an eight or nine weight rod. So I've gone lighter on the weight, um, on my weighted flies, just to get the tipping motion. I'll, you know, the guys are really into the swimming flies. Swimming flies work extraordinary um, in certain situations. You know, I really have a tendency to see as that water temp crumbles and falls into the low 40s 30s up here whatever it is if you can fish a little bit of lead it doesn't hurt you know what you notice in most situations when water temp is below you know i when i'm on the lakes i look at it at about 45 degrees everything is pinned on the bottom so anything that's going to try to seek refuge is going to the bottom that's where there's going to be there's more security that's where it's a little bit the water's more stable it's not as cold as that top layer um which is typically your coldest water so everything kind of reverts down and it seems to be a big trigger for fish. Um, and you'll see it here when you're fishing, you know, you get a fish follow, stalling a fly out and watching it tip down, they'll just come up sometimes and suck it in. Other times they kind of don't want it and something that hovers and kicks a little bit more will work better. That's when I use more of the swimming type flies, which is the other fly I tie on the same pattern. You know, it's got a little bit more bucktail, small brush for the head, and that's gonna cover those situations. I'll fish those more in that you know, it depends. I will fish it in colder water when I'm fishing shallow wood structure. If fish are pushed to edges and actively out on edges, they're going to eat these because you're fishing, say, one to three foot of water. And as long as you're splitting the water column, you'll do fine. If you're fishing, you know, five, six, seven foot deep holes, I want to get it down. I want to be down three, four, five foot to really get it in the fish's head. And that's when I'm going to go to more of the lead. You'll also see as that water warms in the spring, fish are going to those edges more because that's usually where your springs and tributaries are coming in that are running warmer than the deep middles of the river. Um, you see that in the lakes, you see it on the rivers, the fish will go to the edge and in high water does it as well, but it seems like it's more of a, a water temp thing is where the bait's going to the edge, the fish are on the edge. So I, I have a swimming fly and a diving fly that both kind of are on the same platform. Um, makes it kind of easy for me as a fly tire and as a fisherman um, to just be able to, you know, it's just, it's simple. Why well, You don't have to make it too complicated. They're just a trout. Um, that's what I tend to see. I also notice that, you know, the deer hair seems to work in the upper 50s, low 60 degree water, but I really see it drop off when you get into the mid to low 50s. You know, I, I mean, I had a client out this year um, where we were running, one guy was running a deer hair headed fly and I had another guy running a small bait fish fly. Now the guy that was running the deer hair, he was getting, he was getting knocked every run we went through. I mean, he'd feel it whap, whap. That was something, that was something, that was something, but he wasn't catching the fish. And other than five walleye that day, but he didn't catch any trout until the light got low in the evening. And then they started eating it better. But throughout the day we ran one, smaller profile minnow fly, small flash monkey that rust ties. And it took all of our nice browns that day and they kept showing at it. Um, and the guy running it was fishing out of the back all day. So you could tell that there was a preference in the lack of vibration, something moving a little bit more subtle through the water column. And that's what I think we overlook as fly fishermen. You know, if, if you go to a lake and fish, you're gonna notice there's a time for a rattle trap, there's a time for a jerk bait, there's a time for top water. When we go to the rivers, we just kind of throw out what we caught fish on last time, which unfortunately is the wrong thing to do a lot of the times. But regardless, um, you don't learn that until you try a lot and you go a lot and you see the differences. So anyway, with that, I'll kind of start throwing together um, the back half of the first fly I'm going to tie. I already prepped the front, you know, or 
two thirds of the other fly we're going to tie. But I'm going to start with a, one of the smaller fish skull deceivers. These tape out at about five and a half inches. Um, for five and a half inch flies, I'm using the B10S hooks, a number two in the back and a number one in the front. Um, I stray away from these any larger than that size. The hook gauge seems not effective. I've, excessive. It's excessive. The gauge is excessive, and I've watched too many fish pile on them that not get hooked. I mean, I did it for a few years before I switched. Now when I run the bigger flies, I run, um, it's a plastic worm hook. It's a Gamagatsu round bend worm hook. Um, whatever. It's, it's meaty. It's mean. It's evil. But it hooks the shit out of fish. So I run it all the time. Um, so to start this fly, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to use a 10 millimeter shank out of the back. These are the, just the fish skull articulated fish spines. Um, nothing fancy, but it's the short one just provides a little wiggle in the back, gives you a little more than the two hook, just the straight two hook platform. Um, I really like my Renzetti Traveler for this. This is a vice I still, uh, first vice I ever bought. I still tie a ton of flies on it unless I'm using huge gauge hooks. Um, this seems to hold these shanks just fine you just kind of pinch it for this back so when you tie it down it'll kind of pinch that metal together i do like using thick thread on these this is danville 210 because sometimes a little crease on the metal loop there you can slide your thread through any of the thinner gsp and it becomes a real hassle so this seems to fill that up a little bit more which is why i use it uh... And I know it's very thick, so you kind of got to think about the number of wraps. But I'm doing so little on this back shank, it's not really much of an issue. Um, just kind of get it down. Make sure you kind of close out that eye with your ball of thread there. And that's fine. Nothing fancy. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to pull off a couple of feathers, match them up. I have a very nice... These are the Whiting um, Rooster Saddles. Yeah. They're awesome saddles. They used to be really cheap. They're not now. Um, but fortunately, if you buy a few, they're going to last a long time. I've had these back before the price jumped. I think I ordered like four of every color, kept all the good ones, sold the bad ones to buddies, and I still got plenty. Haven't had to buy one in 10 years, I don't think. Um, but I'm going to go short on the tails. Obviously, you can go as long as you want. I've had more luck. If I were to say year over year what produces more fish, I'm going to say six inches and smaller. There are certain situations I do like bigger and I like going to eight inch, but bread and butter, feed the family, five to six inches is a lot, is plenty of fly. And I might even downsize it a little more for rivers like the Upper Manistee, you know, anywhere above, say, CCC, I guess, you know, as you start getting more volume, bigger depth, high water situations, that's when I like to go bigger. Um, high water in the spring, I'll run eight inches and not even flinch. Um, Fall, winter is a little different. I tend to stay a little bit smaller. Because um, those, and, and it seems like the fish, there's times a year it seems like fish want to move for a bigger meal. It seems like spring is one of those times. Um, late fall they move for them too, but it seems like five to six inches will still cover what you want. So I'm going to kind of measure it up, get it laid in there. I'm always going to trim the fluff and then kind of cut it so there's a few teeth in that. I don't know if that really helps a ton, but in my head it does, so we just do it. I don't really care. Some people might tie one on one side, one on the other. I tend to just lay them flat on one side, make sure they're going off the back nice and straight. Doesn't really matter that much. Is that going to work? Yeah, sometimes I pull it out because those teeth do get in the way a little bit of checking on that. So yeah, it looks like that's going to flare out just fine. It's going to be straight off the back there. Once it dumps down, yeah, that'll be fine. And that's just so it doesn't look like crap when I'm done tying it for you guys. Personally, I wouldn't care. Um, another step I'll put in just for the people at home who like to do it is I'll, uh, yeah, that's pretty flat. Flat enough. Um, we can add a little flash. You surely don't have to. You know, I'm putting a lot of flash. Eh, I got to retie it. I'm not happy, you know. Um, so a lot of times I don't use a lot of flash. You'll see a lot of people be like, oh, you got to have flash here, flash there. Eh, I'm not a believer. I, I don't know. I would rather go less with flash and have a little bit. You know, if you watch bait fish moving in the water, it tends to not be that much flash. It's just a little bit here and there. Um, I like the lateral scale. I'll just put two strands on this, you know, coming off each side. And, you know, I'm using some body material that, is pretty flashy in the core so it, it you know that's enough flash as far as i'm concerned i 
you know, like I said, I like that little flash monkey of Russ's, but other than that, I, I, I don't necessarily fish a ton of flash. I, fish, no. Big fish especially, no. They, what looks right, what doesn't look right. Look, anybody can go out and catch a 17, 20 inch fish. It's what happens when that 25, 26 inch fish follows. That fish that's lived there eight, nine years, does he eat it? Because that's what should tell you what works and what doesn't work. Um, and once again, I'm lazy, so I just kind of tie it in on one side, wrap it around to the other, and make it work. You know, try to get it about as even as you can. Some people will make sure they lay it flat on both sides perfectly, and that's fine. I won't. Um, and you always trim them about right at tail length, maybe just a touch further. Whatever, good enough. Then all I'm going to do to finish off this bag, and I've played with these where I've tied bucktail on the back, I've used longer shanks, put a little flash and a little bucktail, blah, 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 whatever. Doesn't seem to matter. Doesn't The fish don't care. It actually seems like it swims better when you just go straight with that than to a feather just to kind of cover up that, that little gap. So now I'm going to use the opposing color that my fly is going to be white now. So I'm going to use white over this just to, I don't know, make it look good. Whatever, but like if I'm doing yellow and olive, I'll use olive tails. I always go with the darker tails. If you're using a two-colored fly, I tend to use the darker the tail. I swear I've seen it work better when you go that route. Um, and other clients of mine have said that too. That I bring it up to them and they're like, yeah, that's what I think I've seen. So that means like yellow and olive, run the olive tail. Yellow and brown, run the brown tail. Olive and white, run the olive tail. Um that's what I've seen. So, and I'm going to take just junk feathers. I mean, I got some horrible slopping that's twisted and turned and everything. And that's great for what I'm doing now because it doesn't matter. You're just going to wrap it like a wet fly hackle here and then wrap some thread back to kind of lay it down. And that's it. I don't want it huge. I want it kind of in proportion to the width of the feathers on the backside. But, you know, that's just to make it look prettier. The other body I tied up isn't set that way. So whatever. I do find it easier when you're wrapping this stuff to kind of flare it off the stem a little bit first so that, you know, you're not wrapping it all down when you're wrapping. You actually get some of the product out there how you want it instead of it all just wrapped down. Four or five wraps, whatever. Oh, I got my, okay, there you go. Whatever. I leave myself some room to tie it off because you're just kind of filling that gap. Boom, tie down. Trim. I got these stupid little scissors that drive me crazy, but they will work. And then you just kind of, you know, sometimes it helps to just moisten your fingers, pull that material back a little, and then you got your nice little head. Boom, done. Simple. I just do, I tend to do, you know, multiple whip finishes just with only two to three wraps. Once again, this is that Danville 210, so it's like cable. You don't, I don't like doing a ton of wraps. It just gets too big of a bulk, so I just do two to three wraps and do it three times and it should die in a tree before that runs out so done simple as can be that's your little back half of the fly you can see that those feathers are kind of in there straight everything looks fine it's just gonna wiggle back there and be the target um <coughs> excuse me so then i'm gonna take my smaller hook the b10s number two jam that in there keep it straight and once again i'll take this danville because it is, I do use GSP and you'll see me use it in a few times tonight. I actually will change it as I switch processes of my fly. I don't like it for a lot of the steps because it gets too slick and materials will move on you. So I kind of, I like to use the Danville 210 for a lot of the other stuff. I know Russ likes to use six uh, uni thread, but I'll break that every five seconds. So I don't even bother trying. Um, when I'm connecting this, I'm not going to do a bead to space it. Um, I'm trying to keep the size of this fly down. So that's what I'm going to do is just do it easy. I always use mono for connections. Um, you can use the beetle on. Sometimes it'll swim better, but any type of wire you use will eventually wear through and break. Fluorocarbon will pull out. So sure, it'd work fine when I'm doing this with no hook in the back. But the second you start connecting your first and second hook, you pull the back hook off. I've never seen it with anything else, but I've seen it with fluorocarbon. I actually like tried fluorocarbon for a few years, for maybe, it wasn't even a few years, it was a few flies. And uh, I was down in Arkansas and that's where you try it and you see it like, oh wait, you know, you blow the back hook off a fly and it's like, well, that never happened before. And then you realize that's because of the fluorocarbon. So I think fluorocarbon's junk for this. Um, 
pound pest is that out? It's 25-pound Maxima Ultra Green. I use 30-pound Maxima Chameleon. You know, something super thick, stiff. I would probably recommend, this is just because this is an end of like a 600-yard spool. Um, and after this is gone, I've got about 3,000 yards of 30-pound Maxima that I use for other stuff. In the Chameleon, I would recommend the Chameleon. I mean, this stuff, look, this will rot out in like 10 years. You will lose the fly first. Trust me. It does not. It takes so long. If your flies are just baking in the sun 365 days a year, yes, you'll go through it quicker, but they're always in a box. I've just not had the issues to make me concerned with it. Um, I will say that the Maxima Chameleon is stiffer. It's more abrasion resistant. So, yeah, sure, it's probably better. But like I said, it, it does. I, this seems to last just plenty fine. But I would do 25 or 30 pounds, something stiff. Um, you could use Berkeley Big Game, you know, anything of that trolling type line that's thick gauge, abrasion resistant, whatever, doesn't matter. It's not, don't spend too much on it. Uh, and then we're just going to kind of loop this guy on the back. These little shanks have enough loop, too, to, with this 25 or 30 pound, it, it still moves it around pretty good. You know, if you go too thick, like 50 pound and stuff, it, it just won't get the wiggle because all of a sudden you're really pinching down that zone. Um, I go tight on my loops. You know, the nice thing about doing it this way is the, they rarely foul, and that is a big thing for me. I, I just, ugh, I've seen too many casts go to the right spot at the right time and end up fouled that it just drives me crazy at this point. So that is the number one thing. Look, it, when you're guiding, you want people to fish efficiently. You know, they got so many casts in their arm, they're only going to get so many opportunities in their day. I don't care personally. I fish enough to not care. When I got someone out there who's actually paying me to go fishing, I want them to have success, and I want it to be easy. And I do that with my rods, my lines, my flies. I want to make it easy for them to cast. I don't want to wear them out. I want them to be able to have success. And the best way for them to have success is you just keep it easier on them. Don't have them fish a 10-foot leader. You know, like you don't, you just, you get a fly line that's easy to handle. You do simple things to make their day easier. And you'll catch more fish because of it. So as you can see, it's a tight little loop back there, but I mean, there's plenty of play on it, so it's gonna move. Um, and like I said, this this second step of this hook is really easy too. I'm just gonna use, this is, so you can do a lot of different things. This is small, uh, what a polymer chenille. You can use the medium, it, uh, you know, I was using the medium. I think I like the small a little bit better on this. It's a tough decision. Um, Not a huge difference there between the isn't, there. No, but if you start laying materials flat, the you'll see it. Huge. I mean, yeah, the large is huge. And, but actually, what is that other stuff that's hard to get right now? It wasn't, the, it was like polar chenille or something, where it was like, I think the large in the polar chenille is almost the size of the small. If you look at it, it is. It's close. It's not as long as the medium. Because I've been using that on these flies. Yeah. This is that large polar chenille. See, it's a little bit bigger, but it's not as big as the medium polymer chenille. This is small, so there is a little difference, you know. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? I don't want it to stick out too much because typically I don't mind it being a thinner, flatter profile. It, it just casts easier. You know, you can make them big, bulky, and round and watch your clients suffer all day trying to cast them. So thinner profile you're going to get plenty of movement too that's the other thing the less drag you have on your back two hooks the more you're going to get kick and action out of them you could load it up with bunny and all sorts of junk and it's going to just drag in the water more and not want to swing as much so less is more less is more um to speed this up too like you can cut two six inch chunks pair them up together and burn through it you know i don't even wrap this as tight as you could it just kind of it's just a filler it doesn't matter but I do like the smaller. I don't, you know, like there's that, the filler flash from chocolate seems to be fine if you're doing like a big round profile. Um, I don't necessarily like it for stuff like this. You know, in this first one, I'm tying with a skull head on it anyway. So I want some depth penetration. And anytime you go a little thicker and stuff like that, it's just going to limit how deep it gets. So you can see it's kind of short, but whatever. The medium will work fine too. Whatever you got. I i use both. I don't know. I'm just Whatever. Doesn't matter. That's not going to change much for performance or fish catching or anything. Or really how it looks. 
but I'm going to leave myself plenty ample room too. That's it. I'm just going to fill over where I kind of tied that in, tied in the mono, and then I'm going to give myself plenty of room to wrap a big chunk of schlopping up here. Um, just, and you're just covering, you know, that's all it is, is just kind of covering that other midsection. You know, as you can tell here, there ain't much to it, but it just covers it enough. Um, and then I'll go back to the base color, which the tail color. Um, I'm using these same fancy feathers off this saddle because they match the color perfectly. And well, there you go. Um, this one's going to be a little wider and a little longer as I get towards the back, you know. Hopefully just a little bit bigger to kind of create that taper going up. Um, you know, as you can see, there's a little bit more taper to it. It looks a little bit bigger as you go up. And that's one of the basic principles of using any of the game changer shanks or anything you're doing like that is it's smaller to larger as you go forward on it. So that being said, I'll start a little bit further back in the feather and kind of just shred the tip off so that I start with a little thicker. Um, and this I'll trim the tip off, but I make sure I wrap a lot of that stem down. And that's also what I'm doing by, you know, giving myself this much space on the hook shank allows me to bring that thread back over it and really um, solidify it. So it's not just going to blow up on, you know, the first fish that eats it, because hopefully you'll get plenty of them. And one thing I will say about, about both of these patterns is like, you know, there's a lot of ways to tie bucktail, and I'll show you how I tie it tonight on in two different ways. These are the ways I use because it makes them durable. They last fish after fish after fish after fish. And that's what I want. I don't want, you know, like, buy a lot of those double deceivers, and it seems like a fish swims by them, and they blow up sometimes, and that's not good. So, I mean, I got them hacked together with glue and everything else, and what I've found is, is tying it bucktail flat or reverse tying it the way I'll show you tonight seems to give you a little bit more longevity out of your flies like I said I'm lazy not so much I used to really love fly tying now I do it out of necessity and I'm going to go kind of thick on this because I want to kind of cover that back up I want to give it that color and that transition of pearl to or of white and olive Get a bunch of it tied in there. And here's where I'll wrap back over some of that feather to get that stem really tied down so that it's uh, it'll last, so it won't just blow out after your first fish. Oh, look at that. And it just kind of covers. It just gives you a little nice transition. Almost covers all the way to the back, but it covers it enough. And then you'll see as I whip finish it, I'm kind of doing it behind the little stem I wrapped on just because you're not crowding the eye that way. And oh, it looks so pretty. And then I'll do a bunch of them. Whatever. I want it to last, like I said. We have a question, Matt? Not yet. Oh, look at this. I mean, is there anybody even watching? We can do a quick uh, jump over Do we have three to, three people three, watching? <laughs> no. We have, uh, 55 no. Yeah, oh, my yeah. God. There's no one. Here's a big name. <laughs> You're a huge job. <laughs> huge. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, we can take a quick break and do some questions real quick. Uh, Doesn't matter. I can keep going, too. Let's take a break. Get a drink of water. Rehydrate. Mm -hmm. We have a big like, general question for you. Sure. If you had only one streamer in your box to fish, a mix of water types, what pattern would it be? And this comes from uh, Chris. I know, that's a big question. I just run the box, these. Alex. I just run these. <laughs> that's it. I don't care. Those things swim awesome. Um, they're durable, they last forever, and they swim awesome. I've caught so many fish on those just what it is and i got buddies who run them too you know like that's a fly i've been fishing a lot in arkansas the last three to four years and the guys who've run them are like oh god that's beautiful yep we're running them you get great swim out of it the other nice thing about it is you know you don't get the depth penetration in fast water which is kind of a drawback but we don't have much fast water in michigan it's not that much of an issue um so it, it doesn't matter the other thing is you put these in the water in a lake and these things swim like crazy so, like, that's what you get with that blocker head. You know, you're going to get kick and swim. So I tie them big for whatever, whatever wants to bite. Bad. You know, I just whip them around and hope a muskie will show up, but they never do. So I end up catching bass and pike and whatever else on them. Um, 
yeah, I think these are sweet. And I like the bait fish program, you know, you tie them in a few different colors. And like I had one of my clients the other day, he was like, hey, can you tie this? You know, he had some color he really liked. He's like, can you tie me another double deceiver? And I'm like, let me tie you one of these. And so I'm like, well, and then he booked me on a trip. We went out there and he ties on his double deceiver in that color. And he's like, it just doesn't swim. I'm like, well, try this one. He's like, oh yeah, that's better. That's better. And he took it down. He was wade fishing with it, caught a couple fish on it the other day. Plus I tied it on lighter hooks and his fly was tied on. And he's like, that's why I've been losing them. And so, you know, things kind of tended to make sense for him there. Um, but that'd be it. I, I like fishing the bigger bait fish. I will say, you know, there's times a year that that won't catch anything. Like, you know, we're kind of getting into this winter time where like, it'll work in some sections, but man, you start throwing a black leech around and you're going to catch 10 times as many fish as anything else. You know, I mean, it's what it is. So. Wow. Well, what it is. It is what it is. You know, I mean, you, when the fish are on bait fish, and you tend to see bait fish bite be really good, like, I, you know, it, it, I see it everywhere. Because you get a good bite out of those. Big fish will still move to those bait fish. But you start seeing, like, you know, as you get cold water, there's not much moving around and not much affected. So what are they, what do they have to eat, you know? And, and I'll run olive to match the bottom, you know. I like running all that stuff, too, especially in the winter. Um, but, frankly, I leave for the winter. So what do I know? I'm gone and I'm fishing rivers that they stock so I can get away with the bait fish a lot of the time you know they stock in Mayo they stock in Odenbile they stock in Arkansas so those fish have a tendency to look for bait fish um that's what I see I mean you know and there's other yeah yeah I'd say that's probably that's fair I think winter's the one time of year that you'd throw some different stuff but like I said I'm not here I don't I'm you know I'm just not here so and that's, yeah, and when I usually, when I go, I go to Hoden Pile or Mayo or I go somewhere with stocked fish that has big fish, because why wouldn't you? I don't care about not catching one. I'd rather go try to catch a big one. So, yeah. That's good. Yep, and and you will, like, like we'll, I'll show you these next. I'll just show you how to do the front half of these on the next one. And you'll see, when you fish these and run these in the water, like, the kick, the they're just easy. They're easy to cast, and they swim great. So... We'll show you that one in a bit, too. I will say, though, like, in the higher water and in colder water in the spring, I do better on these than I do on the, the brush. This one swims great, and I see it, but, I, man, I'm telling you, that depth penetration right up next to the structure seems to get better, you know, in, in high water situations. So that's where we're at. And I don't – I really like taking two clients because I really like the ability to – have a couple of different things to try when you start you know like you it's nice to have little natural little this and I, I mean you know and i'll take that you know like this fall i had great fish in this fall throwing sculpins more than bait fish you know it just seemed like we got in a window and I, and hell arkansas was the same way last year like there was a february time frame where it's like yeah the bait fish would get one or two big fish to go a day maybe but you'd shuffle 20 on a sculpin pattern so you know if you really got to get a you, you just got to dial yourself in, and it is different every day. Um, I've been asked a few times if I like to put together a little a starter on how you would set up a fly box, and that's something that like I fight with in my head too because, I mean, I got four fly boxes when I go fishing. You know, I've got... That's it? Yeah, that's it. Two <laughs> suitcases and two that are about this big. So, you know, and I kind of keep sculpins and four-inch bait fish in one, and I kind of keep six to nine-inch flies in the other, and more bait fish patterns there and then I have my smaller stuff which is like peanut envy and smaller box and then I have my you know one to two inch box so yeah, it's like, it's uh, a tough one is it Pinterest level organized where it's just it's the, getting it there like it's it's getting there glamour shot. yeah it's it's pretty <laughs> close right now I've had a lot of downtime bags. no no <laughs> it's pretty organized I've right now oh you see box. mine in a month and it'll just be like a ball of stuff and I'll yeah. be like there but right now it's it's yeah it starts organized before i go to arkansas it's organized and I, i'm like oh i have a couple of these couple of these okay it looks good now as long as you start organized yep and they'll be a disaster in no time yep and you'll know what's working because i'll be out yeah you have to start something you have to know what you have before you can decide what you need to tie I keep a picture in there to show people I'm like this is what it started as yeah don't 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 yeah. don't worry it's my client's fault no it's good and, I, and i'll shuffle through a lot like you know, you talk about one streamer pattern. Hell, I'll change 
colors three times in a day based on light penetration or your condition. I mean, those are all little things you got to think about, like water level, water clarity, sun penetrate, light penetration, you know, all of those things have an impact on what fish see. You know, it's, it's just what it is. You know, you, yeah, that's, yeah, and what mood are the fish in? You know, is it a low light situation where fish are pushed to the edge? Is it not where they're all sitting in the deep centers? I mean, there's so many variables to it. It's not, that's what gets overlooked. That's what gets overlooked in streamer fishing. People think, oh, I'll tie this on and go. Well, yeah, but no. You know, you can do that and you'll catch fish on occasion. But if you actually spend the time and see what's going on and think about it and transition as the fish transition throughout the day, you can actually catch fish all day. Um, I had a client this year in Mayo where I think we moved, oh, I don't know, 15 to 20 fish over the course of the day. And it was having to switch patterns. You know, we had to go to two to three different things and we consistently caught and saw fish throughout the day without that change you won't do that but you have to know enough knowledge to be like wait a minute we went through those many good spots we were seeing fish now we're not okay we got to change okay now we're seeing fish again okay wait what happened to our fish why aren't we seeing well let's try this okay now we're seeing fish again so it's changing but if you don't have (coughs) if you don't really have like an idea of what fish, where fish are, what you should be seeing, what you expect to see, it's hard to know how and when to make adjustments. That's what you get from being on the water a lot, is understanding, okay, now I gotta change. Okay, something's not right, I gotta change. Okay, this is happening, I gotta change. Um, yeah, I think that's big. I, and I, that's, I've been doing it more, the more I do that, and the more I'm willing to change and move throughout the process, I see myself having more consistent fishing, more hours of the day, good days lasting longer because I'm adjusting with the fish, you know, and you just, it's something you process and learn something, but it takes time on the water. Um, But once you get it figured out, you can really dial them in and you can catch fish. Um, It's not as much of a, you know, random luck. I think people like to think of it as random luck and it's, you know. There's a reason some people always get lucky. You know, maybe it's not luck. Um, As we get back to tying. uh, So here, I want to show you one thing on doing these connections with mono too. Like, I'm going to lay this in. I'm going to keep this off the eye of the hook away. Because I'm going to put some bucktail in there. So I want to make sure that I've got some distance. And what I do with mono, I don't glue it and stuff. But I will flip this back on there. I'm going to put my little... Pro eye red little bead, little target in the middle. And once again, kind of snug on the connection. Just don't want to foul, don't want to foul, don't want it fouling. That's all that matters. Don't let it foul. And bite it. Bite, bite, bite. So I'll go pretty tight on this, and that bead will kind of space it just enough, you know. And that's the thing. If you want to increase your distance and profile, like, that's fine. And what I'd recommend then is, like, You know, I'd run the bigger hook in the front. I'd run this size one for the stinger hook. I'd run a bigger hook in the front. I'd go two beads. And at that point, you're either going to want to add slopping or bucktail on this backside to kind of cover. With what I'm doing here, you know, you can see with, you know, I'm kind of covering and creating that smooth transition by the length of my bucktail going there with just the one bead. If I were to space it out with two beads, you know, you're going to have to add a little more filler in there somehow. I mean, in theory. I don't know that it matters. So I'll go pretty tight on this bead and loop connection straight off the back. A little bit of room to play. Oh, that should be fine. Let's see. Yeah. Um, and then I'll wrap this. So I'm going to wrap this mono. I put it in on my side and I wrap it back and then I wrap it on top of that going forward. And then when I get to that point that I kind of trim the other one, I always turn this mono back and just secure it down. I give it a little bit give it some wraps on the top and that uh, like I said I have n- I'm n- I don't think I've ever had one of these fail so and I've had fluorocarbon and I've had wire fail and I've never had one of these fail so we were in Arkansas a bunch of years ago and my buddy had a fly that was connected with wire whatever and, and he caught a great big fish on it it's t- over 29 inches whatever and the next day we were out casting and the back half of this whole fly went flying <laughs> and it's like oh man <laughs> so at, you know it didn't cost him the fish but it was enough to be like okay wire that i'm not going that route 
Um, a lot of guys do like the beetle on, and it, it does move smooth, and you get a lot of wiggle out of it. So, you know, whatever. Then I'm just going to, once again, use this same material just to kind of, that polymer chenille, just to kind of cover. Um, I'll give myself a little less room on this one than I will the next fly. This one I'm going to tie the bucktail in straight, just kind of vertical more than anything else. So flare this out, fill that hook shank. I know I have true rotary and I don't even use it. Oh well. Oh well. I will say this these Renzettis are workhorses though. These little travelers last forever. Like I had to buy one set. I might have gone through two jaws in twenty years. But this was the first No, I had to get this replaced once. But I also got this when I was 16 years old, maybe 15, and I started tying for Rusty. He was like, you need a decent vice. So I am 42 now. And once this whole midsection locked up and they sent me a whole new one at no charge. And then I had to replace the jaws, I think, twice. And I do like the cam more than the screw knob. So I'd say that that's, I mean, I think it was a $130 vice when I bought it. I mean, and I don't think, they're only like, but they're only like 160 or 170 now, aren't they? It was a C-clamp Renzetti Traveler. Yeah, yeah that's dirt cheap. To See, that's... <laughs> but you should really buy the limited edition blue <laughs> Yeah, I should. Maybe <laughs> I will. Edition. Yeah. No, and, you know, like, I remember seeing the fancy gears and all, I, you know, and this, whatever. No, it's, Rusty used to have the Asable speed the crank on it. To, oh, it perfect just... Perfect way to yeah. describe that. I've had good luck with them, so... Yeah, it kind of fills it up right there. Um, and that's about it. I don't know how much distance I left myself there. What's that, a quarter inch? Something like that. Whatever. We're not going to worry about it too much. Now, this is like... Okay. I'll go back to why I dislike GSP is because it's really slippery. But let me tell you, if you have bucktail that's not very good and doesn't want to flare much, GSP is great thread. So sometimes, yeah, I'll go into it now. Why not? Well, I'll just do a couple whip finishes on here. and I mean, I haven't broke my thread yet. I can't believe that. I'm sure I will at some point. Uh, uh, now, this is one where, you know, I'm kind of doing this because I also got to jam a skull on here. Yeah, that's going to be just fine. Just fine. Uh, once again, kind of light with the bucktail. Yeah, this is is not hollow hair. This is kind of junky, but whatever. We're going to make it work. doesn't matter. Um, you don't need a ton. You really, you know, I want to cover it. I want to make it have decent look for the profile and whatnot, but I'll take my junk bigger scissors that are dull and use it. Um, when I'm dealing with bucktail, you're always trying to get rid of the under fur, the shorter fibers. That just takes up space. And then what I'll always do with this top part is I kind of... Pull out some of the tips and even it up. There you go. See, and then I'm kind of right there. Tips are pretty even. Might have tied with bucktail once or twice. And that's where we're going to kind of measure it up. Now I'm going to, I usually just brush this out just to make sure there's not junk in there. Pull out a little bit more. And then I'm going to kind of measure it up. You know, I want it just past that hook chain. Yeah, that looks about right, doesn't it? Oh, I think that's just fine. Um, a lot of times I like to tie it in with it still long. See, and what that GSP will help flare that now. Is that too long? Eh, eh, it might be a little too long. Shorten it up a touch. But see, that GSP will help kind of flare that out. And it doesn't really matter because by the time you jam the skull on there, it's going to um, condense it kind of down anyway. But the reason I, I like to do it like that with those tips long is if you go in now and segment that hair with your GSP or whatever thread you've got, you're really getting it tight in there, and it, it's just not going to move. If you don't do that, you know, bucktail pulls out, it slides, it slips, it's not the best. So I, I really recommend going in, you know, kind of just cross-sectioning that that bucktail at the head, deer hair, whatever you're tying with, that's the best way to get it to really lock down. You know? 
and I'm always going to kind of pull it, make sure it's even, you know, on all the sides. And I got to come back because I pulled that a little forward, but that's going to be fine. Like I say. Okay. So we got the bottom half. See how I kind of just make sure it covers up both sides. Yeah, there we go. That'll be fine. Then we'll go to the olive for the top. And usually I just start with a little bit of olive. This is another one that's really not going to flare, but... Oh, that GSP will make it happen. And I don't use a ton on this first clump. It'll end up being about the same amount as um, the bucktail on the bottom. But I'm going to do it in two different ones because I'm going to add a little... Uh... Well, you got to put a little peacock in there, don't you? So we will end up doing that. But we'll get these all evened up as best as we can. And, you know, people like the rounder profile on, on a lot of their bucktails that they tie. And I don't blame them. It does look nice. You know, when I'm tying something that's going to sink, though, I, I don't mind having it not have that. It You know, it's going to sink a little bit better being a flatter profile. Um, kind of space that out. Pull on that GSP. Watch that flare out a little. And then, once again, kind of cut through that head with the thread. Just get it locked in there. Trim it. And it can go, like, this is flaring all over the place because I am using this GSP, but I also know that that cone's going to condense it down to kind of how I want it anyway, so it's I'm not worried about it. Um, I'll take a little bit of Peacock. And, oh, boy, that seems like a lot. Oh, yeah. Get it laid right on top. And then we're going to add a little bucktail over that again, too. And that'll kind of protect it and actually make it last a little longer than it would if you were to just leave the bucktail straight on top. Not that I'm sure it matters, but, you know, whatever. Whatever. And then you just need a very little amount. I mean, I don't even know if I'm toothpick thick on this. You know, it might, it might be a toothpick each time, you know, roughly for the top, for the two chunks of bucktail. Of olive bucktail. I see a lot of people use too much. A lot they of people don't. use too much. Way too much. And it's not. And it doesn't. That's part of the problem with things pulling out and not sitting you can't, down is you can't bind it. You can't bind it. You can't cast it. It kills the action of your fly. Like one of the best flies I've ever seen using bucktail is one of those old Sadati slammers. And he used like, I swear, 15 pieces of bucktail on the top and the bottom. It just, it draws a lot. So you, you can really. You can get away with about, I'd say it, mo I mean, half, a third what most people use. This is a little thick on the head. I might have gone a little heavy on the white underneath, but whatever. It's be fine. Once again, it doesn't matter. To some degree. Bucktail is a material you have to be careful with, though, and the amount you use. It's, uh, it just, it'll kill the action, and it'll kill your arm. I used to not care, but. My arm doesn't work like it used to. And see, I've given myself plenty of room now to get that skull on there. Yeah, that's going to work out just fine. Give a couple thread wraps back. Yeah, it should be fine. I always like to put jam the skull on there first before I finish this piece. Because what I like to do is give myself enough room to finish off with the Danville in front of the skull. Um, which that should work fine. And then that'll make sure that that skull's locked on there for a long time's sake. So we'll do a couple whip finishes here. And this isn't as important because I'm going to end up coating this with a bunch of glue. So at this point, I'll use... The, I like this stuff, this the gel control Loctite. It seems to... Well, it works, one, and it doesn't run everywhere. It's nice and easy to use. And I'll just make sure I get it all around there. Like that. See, it's not a terrible mess. I like Zappy Gap a lot, but it can be a little bit more problematic. Make sure the skull is down. See, the weight goes into the belly here. Make sure I like to see those pretty flies tied upside down. <laughs> that's always when you know you got someone on the internet. They're like, hey, look at my sweet flies. And I'm like, yeah, sweet. <laughs> and then I'll just go in and put... And you can see how... 
you can see like how that. like the bucktail kind of is more form fitting when you jam that skull over the head. And then I just give this a few wraps on the front with this Danville. Trim it up a little. And then just a couple whip finishes in the front and that'll that'll keep it in place. I've not lost a skull because of it. I did kind of crowd the eye a little. It's a failure. He's a failure. Turn it over. Yeah. No, I can still fit 30 pound through there. We'll be fine. It'll be fine. there and that's that and you could put a dump of glue in there if you wanted to or not and then you could glue eyes on there and all that funny stuff too let's see simple lot of motion to it easy little bait fish pattern um yeah catches lots of fish oh lots of fish and yeah that one catches a lot of fish and no one really fishes them here in arkansas they get sold out pretty quick but it's more of a big water streamer too. It's a little bit larger. Um, I don't know. What's your terminal setup look like in terms of lines down there for fishing something like that? Man, I I've had so a hard you time. Switched around a lot. I have, and I keep going back to those Rio striper lines. I really like that Rio striper thirty foot tip, man. It it's so angler friendly. I see more knots with the airflow lines. I see, you know, and I haven't used the SA ones that much, so it's hard to say. Uh, for a while there, they had the wet and the colds, and those didn't, those seemed like upper main of steel lines. They didn't really sink that good. Um, I, man, that striper line is angular friendly. And I put that on a nine foot, the 300 grain striper on a Sage X nine foot eight weight and one of those Spectrum LTs. Every client who touches it can bomb it. You know, it's no brainer. I do the nine weight with a 350 striper. I do the eight weight with a 300. Clients pick it up and they can cast it. They can all cast it. It that's number one. I want something that's easy for them to use, something that they're comfortable with, and that rod does it. Seems like the igniter. I'm not as much of a fan as the igniter as I was the method. The method's a little crisper. Um, the sweet spots are a little smaller in both those rods, even smaller in the method. But when you boom it, it's, it's a phenomenal rod. <clears throat> but that Sage X seems to be just money for people. It's, it's just so easy. for. And plus, I used to rush and force cast a lot more and run faster rods. And, you know, my shoulder can't take it. I've gotten more into the habit of, like, making less presentations that are quality presentations. I make a good cast. I don't care if I, it's one, two, okay, here it is. I know where I'm going before I get there. So line it up ahead of time. 90% of the people, 90% of the clients you take, cast, 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 cast. 90% of those casts are pointless. Sorry. Yeah, sure, it might happen, but it happens here. Yeah, it could happen, but it always happens there. So why not take your time and make it good there? You know, and once you start, Arkansas is no different. They go floating down the river and think, oh, it's all great, it's all great. And it's like, yeah, they're there, they're there. You ought to watch the bait guys fish Arkansas. They're like, why are you over there? There ain't no fish there all by that rock. That rock? Yeah, that rock. Oh, what are you doing down there? That's junk. Well, it ain't up there. They're right there. Yeah, you start realizing it. Well, I mean, I remember years ago, I caught this fish on a streamer, and I'm like, I'm like, Craner's one of the bait guys down there. I've known him for ever. He was like the only guy that used to guide out there bait in the winter. There was just a few boats, and I'd see him every day. He's hilarious. And one of these days, I caught a real nice fish, and I'm like, hey, I got one of your hooks for you. I gave it to him. He's like, oh, hell yeah, that, I was right behind that towhead rock right there, and I'm from Cotter on that spot. And I'm like, well, it was on that bank cross. He's like, no, it was behind that towhead rock right below the creek, right across the cotter. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> so you get this, <laughs> you know, and then that's the way they are. No, no, no. You, I mean, I remember back, they used to change some stuff and like, I mean, he's like, we're going to get a bite there, there, and there. I'm like, huh? Yeah, we will. Get a bite there, there, and there. Bang. Get two bites the first pass, third bite. Yep, that's our fish. Let's go. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's, you know, so when, like, we see it in Michigan, it's like, fish go to feeding spots to feed. And the same thing they're doing down there, you know what I mean? So it's like, we see it. When you're out there on the river a lot, we know. We know, no, that's the cast. Yeah, it could happen there, well, maybe there, but that's where they go. And it's just different fish shuffling into the same spot, you know. One night it's a 16-incher, one night it's a 26-incher. 
It's what fish is out, which one is going. You know, it's that's what we're all faced with. You know, you look at a river, the 90-10 rule always holds. 90% of fish are in 10% of the water. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Yeah, because there's a spring that comes in there. That's why there's fish there. When there's no spring. Well, how the hell is anything going to live there? There ain't nothing there. A couple of trubs, maybe a brook trout. Who cares? You know, so it's just what it is. You know, and the more you fish low-density fisheries, the more apparent it becomes. You know, if there's not cold water coming in, you don't have fish. Period. You know, I mean, anything. That's just how it gets. Um... I think we get jaded, you know, you go, well, and especially when you start fishing in your younger years, you go fishing and you go to the holy water of the Asabla and it's like, oh man, they're everywhere. Well, yeah, this is everywhere, but that doesn't matter. The, you know, and those are nurseries, you know, it's like that upper Manistee, not, well, eh, spots of the upper Manistee, <laughs> but not, can't say the whole upper, the, you know, the upper Manistee is kind of different sections. You know, you've got a high population in one area that's smaller fish and you got spaced out brown trout water other places. So it, you know, it kind of varies. And so you can see the change right in there. You know, you go to the nursery, you go to where the bigger fish are and it just changes. All of our rivers are kind of like that. You know, obviously, I spend a lot of time on that the lower Manistee or the Asable and the lower Asable, and it's, you know, I see 30 boats going down to float one section of Hex, and I'm like, wow, there's nine good spots there. There have been nine good spots there for 20 years. Now there's 30 boats? Well, somebody's going to have shitty fishing, you know, but whatever. So I don't do it. <laughs> Why go not catch a muskie instead? <laughs> they can have fun. Um, and I remember seeing it years ago, like, I was floating or whatever, and I drove by 4001, and there was, like, nine trailers there. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's six spots there. There are six spots that have fish. Oh, there's seven miles, and there's six holes with fish. And there ain't nothing else anywhere else. You know, it's like, I don't think I ever, you know, well, I think I went back there once last year and was like, yeah, no, no, I, yep, I know why I don't ever come here again. <laughs> Haven't been back either. <clears throat> so that's a lot of it you know it's just finding the right fish that are out um and having those days when they're there and and the more you fish the more you realize that they're in very limited areas do you have any questions or i just keep tying everybody no, hang up some, they're all gone we have some left field no, no, oh good let's like get left field people. i like left field let's go to left field uh, let's go back to the beginning here uh -oh. we have a lot of people saying hi oh uh, hello hello I'm sure you know Joyce. Oh, oh, Joyce. Yeah, Joyce and Al, yeah. yeah. She <laughs> liked our Pinterest comments. <laughs> <laughs> I bet my wife did. Oh, that she won't be watching. My wife. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Bit. Don't worry. My wife won't be watching. <laughs> I know Annie's watching. So. What? Oh, that's nice. Is Dan on there? Is Dan from New Jersey on there? Uh, let's see. Let's go. Well, we usually just see the people uh, commenting. So hmm. it's, uh, uh, we had one gentleman right at the beginning. Uh, can't pronounce your username, sir, but uh, curious about, um, oh wait, hold on, I'm looking at the wrong one. Curious about what oars you're running. No, nah, I don't care. Uh, I'm running a pair that need to be replaced because they're about to break in half. I think they're they're Charles like some Sawyer. Asked they're, that. Charles asked that. Yeah, and they're really nice. They're like some Sawyers, but I'm telling you, they're like one almost exploded on me in Arkansas. If you got caught like somewhere, I'm like, oh god, I got to replace them. And you know what? Still haven't. So. I hear great things about the shoal cuts, you know, like I'd go with the Sawyers. The square top seemed a little heavier in my hands than some of the other oars out there, but lighter the better. And the well, Sawyers the seem to be the best. Like the yeah, a lot of people have liked yeah. the shoal. Yep, that's what I hear. Everybody's like, oh, you got to get them. Got to get them. I don't know what oars were on that last boat you had. Well, those oh. were custom oars. Yeah. They were prototype oars. But John. Oh, from Carlisle nice. When they were in green. So nice. Oh, were they? Yeah. I should have never sold those oars. Super light those. shaft and... Yeah, they were kind of like the Pro Locks. Yep. But yep. they were floating blades. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yep, yep. Yeah. Who's yep. the guy who you asked about? Dan. Dan? Dan. Well, Prime Fly Company. Dan. He'd be Prime Fly Company. Oh, he told me he was going to tune in. He's from New Jersey. Yeah, I see. He says that. <laughs> he doesn't care. Well, I'll watch. <laughs> I'll care about you. Huh? Maybe he's digging out from two feet of snow. Ha! <laughs> Have fun out there, buddy. Do you have questions? Um, no, I, I was I was curious about the gear. I like that. Yeah, you know, yeah it just seems like that. I, I mean, the more I've guided, like, yeah, I can make it as hard as I want. I can make it hard. I can make you do make this huge cast with this huge fly and long leader, and you know, nobody can do it. 
Why? You give them something that works. How long is your leader? What are you running for a leader? You know, I jump all around. I'm running carbon down to the final piece, but I'm usually running a swivel in between, and I'm running Maxima because I have 8 million miles of Maxima. So I just run Maxima down to a swivel. Like, what was I doing? 30, 25, 20, and then swivel to 16-pound sniper. Wow. Two more sections than I expected. Yeah, but you're going from an 8 or 9 weight line. Yep. Okay. So even, you know, even 40. You know, 40, 30, 25, 20. You can't jump. Maxima, you shouldn't jump 30 to 20. It, 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 there's just, all of a sudden, I think you jump like three or four spots instead of just the two. So I end up throwing 25 in there. I do like it a little longer. And and I, you know, on the upper man of Steve, four foot of 16 pound, well, I don't care. You know, but if I go somewhere where it's part of it too, and part of my rationale behind a longer leader is also, I'm really disliking the impact of sink tips on the water. That scares a ton of fish. Dude, you can't do it. You cannot, do, like low water situations, oh my God. You know, I like I'm saying these Striper 300, yeah, it's great higher water line. I love the real 4Ds with the Type 6 and like the Type, I think it's the I Type 3, Type 6. Yeah. Those are awesome, man. Those things hit like a dry fly line. Yeah, I can flat out take clients out there and see more fish go. I'll take a guy with a 200 grain and a guy with that other one and he'll move more fish on that 4D in low water situations especially think about the manistee it's a pancake oh, yeah. so i i do i've really gone to those more in lower but they're, they're harder to cast you know so like you actually have to cast you can't just flop it and wing it like a sink tip you know like you got a double haul load and fire but i also like it on the lakes too because if you get a flatter day it's soft you know i don't necessarily like those heavy sink tips in the lakes because then you can't stall your fly you know you put a sink tip on the lake and it falls like a rock use something like a 4d and you could ch -ch 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 pause 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 get them to eat it feed them gotta Give feed them kill shot. gotta feed them you gotta feed them they don't you gotta feed these fish like how often are fish committing suicide really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an hour every week you know other than at night and even then you know they get kind of picky sometimes john just asked uh what your favorite do you pay one do you pay attention to flows on the manistee for streamer fishing and eh, no because i just go because it's like <laughs> I, you know i get a guy trip and i go you know I mean, you frankly to, you obviously don't, oh i look it's it. not like yeah oh it's it's this we gotta go, we gotta right? go no it's more time i mean you just know certain times right? yeah I mean. yeah yeah i don't know that i really pay attention to flows i know that if it's over you know if you're over 1400 at sherman that's tough business I know when I don't want to be there, I'll tell you that. You know, I know like, oh, God, don't go there. Oh, that's going to be screaming. Um, that's what I pay attention to more. I don't care. I, I, people pay don't. Pay attention to the extremes, not the. Well, oh, I don't care about low water. Others. Give me low right. water. Yeah. I'll catch them out. The Shit extremes out of in terms of high, I yeah. know a, a, a small river that's, you know, not too far from here. I know I can't put it under the bridges. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's certain. You know, well, that, I don't fish it when it loses so easy, the bank. But, Right. When you lose the river corridor and you got the swamp up, you got water up in there. Oh, well, I ain't dealing with that. It's garbage. As long as it's staying within its banks, I'm happy. And I don't like people hate low water. I like low water because I can catch them in low water. A lot of people can't. You know, you got to adjust your presentation, adjust your approach. And I'll go into that. I'll go streamer fishing all of July and August. I don't care because I know how to adjust my program to catch fish and still be successful. You know, it's just not spring where you, any idiot can heave at the banks and catch fish that's why i like it it's harder who cares anybody can get lucky in the spring show me who's catching fish in september low clear water in september who's catching fish august wow. <laughs> i like those times i take guys i'm like hey let's go try this oh man i can't believe we could catch these I'm like yeah you know but i don't talk about it i don't sell it because then you just got people what and plus i can go musky fishing then Kyle, or Chris, excuse me, uh, I'm going to modify these questions because it's the best way I see it. So, um, what's your most productive color scheme, would you say? They asked if you had one color to throw, what would it be? I think. I guess I'm Yeah, you know, I go, I go between, I really like yellow and olive in low light conditions. I've always done really well on yellow and olive in low light conditions. Um, I like white and bright sun. A lot of times I'll run white and bright sun. Straight white? 
yeah, white, white, and olive, whatever. I like them straight white. But it doesn't, I don't, you know, I run, I run them both. Yeah, I, I, it's all dependent on the day. All dependent on the day. It's light in penetration. Head, I have this giant dichotomous key of variables. Mm -hmm. And it's all just ticking small little boxes. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. I will it's say, like, as you get more shifted into low light, morning, evening, and stuff, it seems like you can just go banana peel yellow. <laughs> they don't care. You know, you get in, you give them a target. Um, yeah, I, I, but I do. I change throughout the day. You know, I'll see a bite turn off and switch to something else. You know, there's a special little light every day, too, kind of late afternoon where ginger seems to work. That's just like you got to kind of be out there. I know. And, well, and if you're fishing the Manistee, you're fishing sand. You're, fi you know, right, I'm, right. I'm an Asable boy, so I'm used to dark colored gravel. So I'm more olive, black, you know, stuff like that it always worked better. You get on the Manistee, sculpins are tan. They look like the sand. You know, Same it's with the PM. You get on the PM yeah. and those dark flies work on Yeah, look at the flies. bottom. And that's what it is. It's situational. It's I mean, I go to the river every day. Like if I can I, I'll use white a lot. I do use white a lot. And I don't know if it's because people see it better or what, but I'll you know, I'll have days where I'll fish white for the first hour and be like, Oh god, and then go to olive and oh, there they are. When do you go to like chartreuse and black and stuff like that? You know, chartreuse is interesting. <laughs> Cause I catch them. There's a certain water color when the water looks kind of greenish. That's when chartreuse works. Yeah. When but I also like catch it when it's, color. there's a green, a yeah. clear green. It's like a clear green. And when I see that clear green water, I'm like, oh my God, chartreuse. But then I also see chartreuse work really good in Arctic water here. Doesn't work in dirty water as well in our, I mean, eh. You can catch them on it, you know, I don't know. You, you, because the second I say something, someone says, "Oh, well, I caught them on this and this color water." You know, right? It's personal preference. It is. I there's a few times that I've seen chartreuse really stand out in in greener, clearer water. It also seems like our tannic water in in late April, early May chartreuse can be good. Um, I like white a lot though too. I like fishing straight white. It's fun. I have a question. There's some good questions coming in mm -hmm. too. I know with doing, we've done streamer events with Russ and some mm -hmm. other guys, and they're very, very attached to the angler's visual connection to the fly. And I'm curious if that plays into your game much at all. I mean, yeah, I think that's why I go to white more. Like, I can fish. It? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think that's part Are of it. You more, I mean, do you see clients? Do you see oh, I like to fish more engaged? When they can see that fly. Yeah, I get them over how it. how it's interacting. Yeah, whatever. I'll get them over it. Yeah. Feel it. You should feel tension in your line. You should feel how much fly that. You shouldn't have to see the fly to know how much that fly's moving. But it all starts with your cast. If you can't cast a tight line, you're behind the eight ball to start. You are never going to really catch up. If you cast a tight line and strip, you go, okay, I'm here. Or if you cast slop and go, whack, 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 okay, now I'm tight. Now I pull, I feel the resistance of the fly. Oh, I don't feel it. Catch up. You know, so there's a lot of that. I end up, I fish stuff out of sight all the time. Like, I mean, I'm like, just bury it out there, guys. Who cares? Feel anything strip like hell? I, I. Do you see a lot of quick eats? I mean, no. times a year? When they're I committing mean, suicide. While, I mean. When they're committing suicide. <laughs> Other than that, you got to feed them. So why am I, you know, I'm more engaged with continue the presentation through. And it. I think by the nature of where I fish, I also see it differently. Look, if you're chasing big fish, they don't... Look, when I'm talking big fish, I'm not talking 16 to 20 inch fish, okay? You're talking upper manistee, you're talking 22 and bigger. A lot of times they follow. Yeah. They're not going to eat it right away because they're going to make sure it's food. They're not though. They've been had. They're not just going to... Uh, you know, that was no, back in the early 2000s. Ooh, right. just like it that. used to be easy. Yeah, smack it. One, the early 2000s, you go to Mayo and hit a fly on the bank and just water just go everywhere. Oh, God, now it's... And then the fish will fade out of view. You don't see them. Then it'll show back up and come on it. You know, like, you got to be engaged. And, and most people just don't see them. You get those random days where it's like, strip, strip, bam. And even on those days, you get two fish to do that, and you get two or three that you could have fed also. Yeah. You know, like, the, one, the client I had the other day, we had a great day. He caught, like, six fish. Two were, like, 23 inches. Great fish. And he should have had three more. But they came slow and were hunting it. You know, he didn't know how to play that fish. If I didn't know, see, you know, I mean, I'm watching the fish, and I'm like, oh, I know how to play that one. 
So it's that's a lot of it. You know, like lake run fish are great. They're stupid till they've been caught a time or two. Then they're smart. Um, these river fish that get freaking annihilated. Think about the boat traffic and how many people throw streamers at Mayo. It is just oh, constant. PM, PM Mayo, upper. PM. I mean, like it. Have you seen the parking lot at the PM? <laughs> like, that's what I hear. I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't even go anymore because I feel bad. I'm like, oh, I can't go on a day off. Those poor bastards need to eat at some point. <clears throat> I mean, I feel that way. Like, it's bad, dude. Yeah. Like, no, oh, God. It's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's where we're taking it. Where it makes yeah, it, now it you it's have so to. It's important with what, how your fly line lands now. It's fly line lands. Fish. It's important to have fluorocarbon. It's important to, you know, like, tease the fish in and make them eat it. What's your bait fish got to do to do this? Sometimes I turn on a dime. your fly lands, all yeah. these little it's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. And then and you, once in a while you have a day, I, I remember my Oh, where they just ripped the rod out of your hand. It was like bass fishing. Fish came straight up. Yeah. I mean, land it, strip, up. Yeah. Gone. I mean, just. Once a year. <laughs> once a year. Like, what is happening? And we switched, and sure enough, different fly. I mean, they were just. Yeah. They were once a year. Probably 55 degree water, 54 degree water. It was probably the first rain they'd seen in a month. And they do it for one day. And then they're all educated. All right, we got a few more short questions. And sure. Gonna yeah, do, I'm going to uh, do one more finish off this. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's see. We're going to skip that one. Oh, come now, on. That one sounds fun. <laughs> I'm going to skip Casey's questions for right now. Um, Casey. Let's see. Casey, Casey. He's a nurse these days, isn't he? Our Casey. Oh, our Casey. Mm. Yeah. He, he could have been here tonight, but he was too cool. He's probably doing some other stuff. Yeah. Um, Okay, so gonna, let's see. What do we want to do? Let's just finish that fly. Okay. And so then, and then we'll hop in and do some more questions. Sure. So, so this yeah. is kind of about where I tied the bucktail in on the last one. Now this one I'm gonna tie some bucktail in, and uh, but I'm gonna do it a different way. This is definitely gonna be with the tan Danville 210. Um, I want to start back here right where I finish this off. See, I've given myself a little bit more room on this, probably just over, you know, it's less than half the hook shank, but it, nah, yeah, just a little bit less. Um, and I hope I gave myself enough room because I've got a lot to add on here. So what I'm going to do now is reverse. When I'm doing this, I can take some of this hollower bucktail that I'm going to deal with because I'm as I'm reverse tying it, it'll all make sense to you why it doesn't matter as much. Um, Take a little bigger clump of bucktail, but I, this is kind of a suspect bucktail to say the least. So I'm going to peel out the small underguard hair, shorter stuff that we don't need, um, and get some of these tips even now. It looks about right. So this is, in my opinion, the right way to tie bucktail if you're going to reverse tie it. I don't like those reverse bullet heads. Seems like they just uh, want to explode. Yeah, you can put some super glue in there and actually make them last. My buddy Christian out in, well, I think he's in Pennsylvania, still likes to do that. Um, this you're going to leave a little longer because you're going to spin it. You're going to flip it the other way to tie it in. So I'm going to go a little longer on it, and I'm going to trim it because of the way I need to tie it in. Then, so I trim it, get it all measured up, and then flip it with the tips going forward. Now, as I tie this in, I'm going to take this, get a loop of thread or two around it, and then kind of start spinning the bucktail all around that hook shank. So, in theory, it's evenly distributed around it's not, but it's going to be close enough. Now, I've tied these. Oh, man. It should be enough room. Um, then I'll actually go back through some of this stuff and kind of segment this stuff to make sure it ain't going anywhere. I might have made this a little tight to the eye, but whatever. It'll, I'll make it work because we can do that here. Um, then I kind of flare out the bucktail so it's a nice circle all the way around the, the hook. And it kind of covers everywhere. Now, I used to tie them just with, like, I'll take my thread forward, 
pull it back. So this is just a uh, deer hair packer. I just use it to kind of push this back. And then I slide my thread forward after I pulled it back. And then I start getting that nice, yeah, that's a little long, but that'll be fine. Um, so now I've got it kind of splared out, just kind of flared everywhere. And then I'm going to go in and make a, it's like a big uh, cone kind of going up that bucktail. And what that'll do is kind of give us a couple of things. It'll give us, a, it'll lay this bucktail back. It also really gets it in place and, and it'll stay there. The You know, even Russ has told me, and Russ is a pretty, say, ornery fly type. You know, like he, he, he cares about his flies a little more than I do. Um, but what he has said is like, he's noticed with the way I do these is, you know, that they, they maintain profile. Like these flies last. These do not blow up. They hold their profile for long periods of time. Years. Years. When you kind of do it like this. And that, I like. Yeah, when Russ gives you a compliment on fly tying, that's good. He will say I use too thick a thread and too much of it. But um, Now, I've tied a lot of them just like this. And finished it off like that. What I've started doing now is adding a little crapper because it gives me a little easier to get the two color combination that I like to fish with a lot. Um, so I'm going to use a little bit of crapper on this. Top and bottom, we're going to go, you know, a little white on the bottom. You know, to give it the white belly. Well, I'll take way too much and throw half of it away because it's crapper and that's sort of how it works. Pull out all the junk. Comb out the junk. Comb out the junk with crapper. It really gets a lot of the short stuff out of the way that just builds bulk that you don't need. Then get those tips evened up. I always do that with all of my stuff. I kind of try to use as much of it as I can. And then I'll go in and pull out. Once I get those tips even, I really try to clean out what's not going to be contributing to the length of it and just building up bulk. There. And then I don't have a ton to tie in. And this is just going to go in on the belly side of this and just give it kind of that whiter belly. And you could add, you know, you can get pretty. You could add a little pink on the sides or a little blue, you know, whatever you want to do. I'm simple. Not very creative. Well, I just don't care. It's part of it. But but I do try to get it so it's nice and even, you know, going up halfway up that, that body. Yeah, just a couple wraps of thread over it. Too much thread. Too much thread. You can just hear Russ barking in the background. <laughs> You're not using six odd. Russ, I break six odd every time I pull on the thread. Um, and then a little olive over the top. Dark back, white belly. Or a light colored belly whenever you're doing it. Pretty simple stuff, but get those tips even on the crafter. That just makes everything look a little smoother, look a little better. And then you got your two colors, and I think this crafter does give it a little bit more life when you're pulling it through the water. You know, you still get basically the same action out of it without it, but, oh, I don't know. I think it looks nice. Oh, it just looks so nice. I like the two different densities, you know, yeah. the bucktail and, yep. and the and, and I've got some that I tied like years ago that are just bucktail in the front and they swim really good too. And I've caught a bunch of fish on them. So it's one of those things where like, I do like it more with the bucktail and the crapper, but I got a couple that I tied like forever ago that just still laugh them. Well, it's just been sitting in my box forever and still work. So depends on how lazy you are, but I do, I do like it. I, I do like adding the crapper. Yeah. Okay. Then we're going to give us a little room in the front. Now, 
one of the probably the least used materials that I see Brian had a full stack of the other day on the wall, which he shouldn't, he should be all sold out of, um, are the flash blend bait fish brushes. And I think I bought the last pack of olive because I was totally out, so sorry. Well, we just got more in. Did you? Well, look at that. Um, <laughs> look, those flash blend bait fish brushes are stiff. They work good. You don't need much, and they will give you a ton of action. Um, you know, like the EP Minnowhead stuff will work too, but it's just not as stiff. It just doesn't work. This is another time I'm going to switch over to GSP because for some reason it's, I really like finishing these flies off with that GSP because um, things get a little pushed towards that eye. When you're doing this brush, it wants to roll down in front. So oh, we'll just add some GSP here. And you can tie a nice little knot. And, like, I use the thinnest GSP I can buy because you can't break it. It doesn't matter. You can't break it. So let me give myself a little room here. Now, so I got these. These are two-inch brushes. They make a one-inch. Look, I trim these way down for most of the flies I use. I just, you don't need much. Even the one-inchers I trim way down. Even the minnow heads I trim down. Um but I'm going to go short on this. You know, you just, this stuff is so stiff. If you put too much of this on your fly, I'll just do donuts in the water. It just, it's like, oh boy, that's, this stuff kicks. So I'm going to be probably under an inch here, maybe a half an inch total width on it. And they make some pretty good color. This olive color is the best olive color they make, but they make a straight white, a straight chartreuse. You know, the main colors you need. Olive, white, chartreuse, black. You can tie some nice stuff with the black, too. And I'm, I'm talking, when I'm going to wrap this, I'm like two, three turns, and that's all you need, and this thing will kick like crazy. Um, I'm going to try to get it trimmed down. You can always trim it once it's on there, but... I don't know. It seems like this works. And with the taper you've created by doing the reverse tie, you can see how you can trim it all the same length and it'll still taper kind of back to thicker as you get back towards the head. Then I'll just tie a little bit of that. I like this GSP because it'll grab that wire pretty good and hold it. Okay. Now, and I'm telling you, it's just a few wraps. I like to brush it out as you go. I also have that brush right next to me. And you got to kind of be careful. You can get in a, you know, that steep head on it can be an issue after you reverse tied and added that crapper. Well, you just kind of got to watch it and, you know, make sure it goes on like you want. But with this GSP, it's nice to be able to get it right to the eye and, and you can really tie it off easily with this GSP. And it doesn't build up too much. You know, and I've had fly tires in Arkansas, and we run other flies and stuff, and I'm telling you, these ones, mm, they kick. They got that action. A couple wraps behind it to make sure it's there. Pull some product away from the eye. Yeah, it's a little sloppy, but it'll do. Not bad for just some stupid fishing guy, and he's just going to be fine. Maybe give it a little push with the thumbnail. And I won't trim it as much. You know, like if I'm tying giant flies and stuff, you know, obviously I use a little bit longer. But, I mean, that one, at, one inch size is about as max I've ever used. A lot of guys like the bigger stuff because they're tying those really large game changers. Um, and they're trimming them down a little bit with them. But they're still getting, they, you know, I think they make them up to like a 5-inch. Something ridiculous, but that's like a 12-inch sucker. And you ain't going to want to cast all that. I mean, that is, that'll kill your arm. This one, this fly will be so light and easy to cast. It, it's just, it's awesome. And, like, that's what I've been saying the whole time about this. You know, I talking about the 8-weight combo and that 300-grain line, like, Man, make it so people, it's going to take more than one cast a day. So make it so people can keep doing it. 
Because you, I mean, I used to run that weight and stuff. People get tired out quick. Big deer hair heads. People get tired trying to move that thing on a 350. You give them something five, six inches and they can grind it. And I'm not, you know, man, I used to catch a lot of fish on seven, eight inch flies. I don't know anymore. I think they've caught a lot more on this size the last few years. And even smaller, you know, just kind of got to mix it up a little. I'm just kind of trimming up the last few ones. But that's a pretty easy bug, you know, and that gets you. I had Andre Sanderson down with Russ a few years ago. He's a Swedish tire. He's a great guy. Um, but he's tying all these sweet, I mean, he can trim some hair and he can tie awesome stuff. And I flip. Oh, it's art. And I flip one of these out there and I'm like, yeah, but see this action? And he's just like, oh, my God. And right there he knew, like, oh, I'm like, why would you ever, ever trim a deer hair head? Get just as good action off three turns of this as you do 45 minutes spinning and trimming. So I haven't flinched. I haven't gone back. It's just, it's, I don't, I mean, I go through too many flies. I don't care. Who cares? I'm going through them. Flies are disposable, right? I mean. Dude, what are you going to do? You get broken hearted over losing one. You're going to have a lot of clients that aren't going to fish with you because you're going to yell. I mean, I still yell at them when they lose them, but, you know, it's not as bad. So I'm like, yeah. Well, even, like, I'm in a situation now, like, that I start tying all these back halves. I mean, I could tie six of those back halves to the flies and go down to Arkansas and just see what the water does and what I need. And I got them half tied already in different colors. You know, so you're just kind of make it as easy as you can, man. Because once you're grinding every day, mm. You ever put eyes on me? No. Sorry. No. <laughs> I don't believe in eyes. I just think it's funny because everybody's like, oh, you got to have eyes, you got to have eyes. And I'm like, yeah. Big believer in eyes. A lot of people are. I don't care. No, I don't care at all. I almost do it. I almost not put eyes on, like, out of spite at this point. <laughs> you know? I'm just like... Eh, whatever. You're such a rebel. Yeah, I know. Jeez. Well, everybody tells me I need them, but no, and I don't want to mess with this head and how it swims. That's part of it. Like I just really it changes. Yeah, it's gonna change the dynamics. Yeah, it's gonna pinch them down. It adds weight to the front a lot of times if you put glue there. You know, I don't want any of that. Yeah, it's just yeah. like I'll, I might actually go back and put, you know, this, these, if you don't put eyes on these, you're real lazy. But I will say, <laughs> I got about 10 in my fly box right now with no eyes on. <laughs> if I don't have the right super glue, I'll just sharpie yeah. around the eye socket so it's a little bit darker. Yeah. I mean, and this stuff works great. I'm telling you, this, this gel control super glue makes those pretty easy. I mean, it's one dab and get it. But I, I mean, I spend half. The damn much time getting it all situated and trying to scoop that little thing on there as you do tying the thing. You gotta do it with a bodkin and then it sticks to your finger. I know that's so I don't even mess with it usually. Sure, and I get you know, but a lot of times, look when I sit and tie, it's like okay, I need three of these, three of these, or I got done with the trip and I'm like, oh my god, I need one more. So am I gonna do that when I could be eating dinner or going to bed? No. <laughs> no. All right, let's answer just a few more questions. Sure. Um, We've kind of kicked past our usual time limit. Oh, um, God. It's I'm been not fun, surprised, it's but this is great. Awesome. Oh, good. This good, good, good. Good, good, good. Yeah, this is um, a deep dive, man. But we're going to do a few questions, and then sure. we're going to kind of wrap things up. I think that's uh, we got a, a few idea. things to talk about for next week and whatnot. Um, so let's hop right in. Uh, we did that one. We did that one. We're going to skip. All right. You have – let me give you – Oh. Three second answers. For oh, jeez. Top two musky flies. Oh, oh. That doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? You'll what? never catch one on one anyway. <laughs> so, you didn't know Alex is a troller. Yeah, jointed musky. hose fatty <laughs> and a jointed Kirby. Good luck finding them. I'm about $800 for two trolling baits. He's got his eBay alerts on right now. He's yeah, I know. He'd call this whole thing off. If it would keep on, he's like, the right. I'm gonna buy this thing. No, what I will say, what I will say is, if you're gonna musky fish, um, look in lakes. Don't worry about the game changer shank stuff. That stuff works good in rivers. Doesn't matter in lake. Get something that turns on a ninety. Um, the 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 swine. I think the the one that Eli ties is a good one. And Matt's got a few too. But the key is, if that fly is not turning on a dime, they're not gonna eat it. It needs to go sideways or they don't eat it. You can get away with a lot more in rivers. The second you go into lakes, it's got to turn. There you go. It's all about action, not the specific fly. Yeah. All yeah. right. And Game Changers really don't, I mean, 
they don't work good in lakes. I don't, I don't, they work for bass, but they just don't work for muskies that well in lakes. We did cover uh, Casey's question. He did ask the uh, favorite line for big water, and I believe that That's was 350. The, the 350. Yeah, I go to the 350s on the nine weight. And I like, I use an eight weight 90% of the time here. The only time I'll go to that nine is uh, high winds with big flies. Yeah. It's the wind that makes you have to throw the 350 on the nine. It's not, usually not the flies. And we got one from Blake. Pick one. I'm oh, rephrasing. Blake Morse. Blake. Pick one. Uh, casting or fly? What's more important? Ooh, Ooh, that's a loaded Ooh. question, Blake. Ooh, boy, is that Blake Morse? Uh, it is. Yeah. Oh, God, oh, thanks, oh. Blake. You're making me <laughs> think. Thanks, Blake. <laughs> thanks for tuning in, though. Casting. Yeah. The, I mean, I'm yeah. a believe. Look, I had okay. So I split a boat with a guy last year or a couple years ago. I had a day off, and he had another guy book, and then I cast. A quarter the amount of times that dude cast and caught I'll fish him 10 to 1 it's because I put my cast in the right spot and I fished it right coming out you know make a good cast fish it right um, if you are not throwing a tight line cast you are not gonna catch fish for you know especially on long cast like look if you throw slop out there you're you're you're, you're never you're gonna how are you ever gonna how are you ever gonna hook a fish a 40 foot cast that's twisty and turny, you'll never get through the slack to hook the fish. So, tight line cast. Okay. Yep. Uh, best time to fish Arkansas? God. Another loaded question. <laughs> <coughs> that's Just a really. Brad. Thanks for tuning in, Brad. That's, that's one of the hardest questions to answer because so much of it has to do with dam flows and stuff. And so much. Ha Look, it's not like. It's not like you're here where it rains and it's going to be right. good fishing that day. That river will get in a rut that it won't fish good for a month. Look, if the water temps are 44 degrees, they're there for 30 days. 42 degrees? I had a year that it was 42 degree water thrown at 20,000 CFS. That's not good. That means there's more food than a fish could ever eat and their metabolism's at zero. That's the worst time to fish it. You want hungry fish, right? I mean... Yeah. It, so that's a, that's a real tough one. I... I I've had great fish in January, February, and March. Every year's different. You know, it's just, it's what it is. It, uh, that's a really, really, really tough one. Watch the internet, and when people are catching them, go. <laughs> that's what you should do. Watch the internet, and when you see everybody posting pictures every day, like leave. I see it now. Well, it's easy. I mean, it's the same thing with muskies. You want to catch a muskie, go and you look at the internet, and everyone's catching a muskie on the internet. Oh, we that's don't look. funny. Uh, yeah, that's hilarious. We got one from Zach. Uh, bigger water, bright day. Oh, we're getting specific. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, big water, bright day, high water. Are you going with a faster sinking line or more weight on the fly when you want to get down? How about that? When you want to get down. I'd say a longer presentation. Go slower so that your line will get the fly down there. You know, not just, you know, people have this tendency to just rip it off the bank or whatever. Like, look, you can only achieve so much depth by doing that. You know, really when I need feel like I need to get down is in cold water situations. Because then pit fish aren't pushing banks and they're not doing stuff like that. So, I usually say, and spots change. Like, that's the other thing you got to think about is like, this spot is six feet deep and good. This spot is two feet deep and good. You know, you got to think of it more like, I got this rig for deep, fast water. I got this rig for slow or moderate current. Right. You know, if I really feel like I need to drag bottom, you go to one of those freaking shovel head air flows and it's going to find bottom. Doesn't matter if you got weighted fly or not. You might shorten up the leader so that it tracks closer to that line that's getting down there fast. Um, I don't go to a tunnel lead because my shoulder can't take it. What about boat speed? I think that's where yeah. how you row makes the big difference. Yeah, because that's also how you can extend your presentation to make it longer. If you're pulling on the oars all the time, you're swinging out. If you go slow and float with it, you're, now your line will penetrate the water column and get actually down there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's it's presentation to get it there. Um, I can't say, you know, yeah. I, I more go to the lead on the fly to get the falling action if a fish engages more than, oh, I'm going to get it right down in the wheelhouse. 
you know and if you're in a boat it's different too if you're wade fishing yeah sometimes you got to go to a weighted fly with more weight on it because you're fishing a small you know if you're trying to fish a deep hole wade fishing i might go to a floating line with a long mono leader and a heavy fly because now you can get it down there and work it slow and jig it through you got a nine to ten foot heavy leader that's going to penetrate the water column better than any sink tip will you hold that uh the label for the, the brush oh, yeah. right at the jaws. I'm gonna pop that up on screen. That's the you'll find it under Renzetti Flash because Renzetti distributes these yep. from just at mm -hmm. H2O, the bait fish brush. These are awesome. Um there's a bunch of brushes from them, a ton of different yeah. ones that we're starting to bring in, we'll experiment mm -hmm. with them. But that's an awesome one. I've played yep. with those and trimmed them down, and you can build just like Alex said the kick there. Yeah, you and you From don't need much. They're just, stiff. They're very great. stiff, and they shed water immediately. So there is no weight to cast them. I'm telling you, I can put a 70 year old dude in the boat, and he can cast this all day and not even flinch. And that's key. It's like you don't make them work too hard. They're gonna have to make way too many casts. I'm gonna correct myself. It's under if you're looking for it on our, our website at least. It's under Flash Blend bait fish brush i'll put that in the chat as yep. well so we can re-reference yep. it but they're awesome i uh, highly yeah. recommend those and uh yeah yeah they'll they'll help you uh okay i think we're going to start to wrap things up the first thing i want to do is i'm actually going to ask alex how do we get in touch with you oh. to go fishing <coughs> oh, or God. to just I mean, yeah, sure. More of I, your stuff out there. Um. So what I do, I've got actually, I've got like a little YouTube channel I just started that just is me sitting in front of a camera. But I do have a lot of stuff that I talk about in there. Um, that's Alex Lafkus Fly Fishing. My website is my initials a l fly fishing dot com. There's a little bit of stuff on that too. Feel free. I think that you'll notice um, on that YouTube channel, I get a lot of random emails and questions through that. I'm really good at getting back with guys on that. Uh, I'm really good with guys, you know, I've had guys ask me, if you're setting up a streamer box, what would you put in? You know, I help guys out a lot through that those mediums, so feel free to contact me whenever. Believe um, it or not, he actually messages me back once in a while. Yeah, and Matt's really, and Matt's the, way the lower down on the list. I am, I will say yeah, so. and Matt's way yeah. down there. Like, I actually, like, I actually, like, you know, clients, customers, people that are interested, I'm a lot nicer to them than other guys in the industry. <laughs> um... I do have some random days open in Arkansas this winter, which is kind of odd, but with the COVID thing. So I do have some days there if there's any interest in doing something like that. And uh, other than that, I try to do a lot of streamer guiding, and then I kind of try to take a lot of June off, typically. <laughs> but if you want a streamer fish, I'm always game for that. Yeah, if you want Alex <laughs> to yell at you. Yeah, yeah. At, uh... I've gotten a little bit. I've gotten a little more subdued. A little bit. <laughs> More here than Arkansas. Arkansas, I might be a little more intense. Uh, but they're so see. big. Other things I want to touch with, if you haven't done so, if you're kind of new to our channel, first off, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, this was a really fun one. We had a ton of people chime in. Awesome job with the chat. Think about hitting the subscribe button and maybe that notification button as well. It lets you know when we have new stuff coming up. Um, and you can see all the fly tying events we have coming up, including next Wednesday, Brian is back on the vice for the redemption, redemption tour. tour. <laughs> the redemption tour. Yes. Uh, those of you who the, sat through the first one, it was uh, a disaster. thank you for your patience. <laughs> yes. uh, but Brian's going to be tying uh, steelhead nymphs. Yes, I'll be tying some and actually, steelhead nymphs. I'm going to get the... I'm going to get the uh, materials list up, and if you're ordering those materials, there will be a coupon so you can actually save 20% on those materials and tie along with us. In, uh, that's a good question. Well, the shipping is <laughs> oh my next, God. Oh my next God. thing on my Beautiful. yellow notepad is shipping. Uh, those of you who have ordered from us recently, thank you so much for keeping us going this holiday season. We are past... Like we've probably blown way past where we can get things to you by the holiday. Um, oh, it's bad. It's crazy out there. So thank. I just want to say thanks for your patience and understanding with that because we want to get you your materials. We want to get you tying and fishing. It's 
we're dealing with it. We just appreciate your patience. So believe us, it's, we're getting it out as fast as we can. Um, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Oh, Brian is modeling tonight. Okay. The brand new, I know it's a small window right now. We'll get some pictures up. We got brand new hoodies out that we'll probably have online within the next few days, probably by the weekend. We'll say that's safe. Maybe by the weekend. Um, shout Thank out to you. our friend Tommy Green, who did some logo You're work for us here. Um, You're starting to death, We're pretty excited about that. And there's a bunch more stuff coming, too, down the line. Stickers, you name it. Shipping, what are we going to do? Um, but let's see. Any? Let's see. We got a few more. We got one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sure thing. Can we even ask Ms. question? I mean, sure. That's all we're not. Bright not. day, but stained water. Should you stick with a darker fly or throw bright flies to make them stand out? I usually water? throw bright in that situation. Okay. Yep. There you go, Nate. Uh, everybody got the info about the. Well, I got one other website too. I've got a Traverse City Anglers one, which kind of has musky and pike stuff. Yeah, musky bass. Yeah, if you don't know, that one's got a nice uh, logo, actually. Alex spends a lot of time yeah. chasing yeah. those warm water fish, which yeah, I like which it. is I, a lot of fun. I've been threatening to to go along for years, but I know. I, know. I don't. Well, I don't call you. You're in the industry. You scare me. You scare me. I don't pay. That's the <laughs> yeah. He doesn't pay. Yeah, no money. Works. <laughs> uh, I think that'll do it. Uh, big, huge thanks to Alex. Oh, of course, Alex, no problem. Thanks, no problem, guys. Man. No problem. That was huge fun. Huge thanks. That helps us out really a ton. Insightful. I know everyone. No problem, really guys. It's fun. This, so. Fun, uh, fun. Yeah. We'll see you guys all next week, right back here Wednesday night, seven thirty, with Brian, the Redemption Tour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like that. And if you wanted to go back and see this again, this will be available on YouTube archive on our channel about 24 to 48 hours. It just has to render. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. See you soon. Thanks, Alex.